And, and then we can, we can get into Q&A, what you have in mind, and what Arvind has in mind, and it can be related to what I've presented, or it can be whatever else you want to talk about. And I'll uh, get from there. With that, I'll get going. And uh, so I think Charlie may be speaking to you soon, which is awesome. And he has this quote, play, pay close attention to the cannibals, the businesses that are eating themselves by buying back their stock. And basically what we're going to do in this presentation is what Charlie says in one sentence, we're going to have about like 45 slides to explain what he means by that one sentence and then take it from there. So I'm going to go through some, some different companies and what they've been doing in terms of buying back their shares and what that's led to. And there's, there are a range of different businesses and some of these you might be familiar with and others you may not, but that's okay. The one that's the poster child or the two that are actually poster children of these cannibals, which are in our time in the sense that they still continue to gobble up as much stock as they can. The first one is NVR, which is a mid-Atlantic home builder. And NVR made, made some changes. They went through bankruptcy or near bankruptcy experience in the early 90s. And the CEO at the time, he did a bunch of soul searching and he basically changed their complete business model in how they operate. And in fact, now the home building industry, most of the other major players have shifted to his business model. What he started doing is two or three things. Number one, no dividends. Number two, no stock splits. And number three, the place where ho most home builders put their cash and capital is in purchasing land. He also went to a capitalite model where instead of having large land banks, he basically went to a model where they only had land for the next year or two of, of homes to be built. And beyond that, they had options on purchasing land from, from landowners. And what you notice over the last 28 years is the share price which was $5.50 in 94 is now approximately $4,000. And in fact, one thing to keep in mind about all these stock prices is that in general, we are not at peak valuations right now. We've seen significant declines in equity. So in fact, if you look at NVR, they were close to 6,000 at the end of last year. So the stock went from $5.50 to about, to about 4,000. It's not a dot com and it's not a tech business. It's a home builder and it doesn't have a fancy PE. It's trading at less than 10 times earnings. So it's not like it's on some euphoric PE or anything. So if you look at the NVR as a business in 93, they had almost 18 million shares outstanding. They have 3.3 million shares now. They've bought back 82% of their shares in the last 28 and a half years. No dividends, like I said, no stock splits. And the stock's gone from $5.50 to more than 4,000. It's a 727 bagger. Now earnings went up 150X, which is massive. Uh, we're gonna look at a bunch of other companies soon and you will notice that none of them took their earnings up anything near that rate. And this is a 27% annualized rate of return over almost 30 years. And so it's, it's quite remarkable what they were able to do. There is a formula I came up with, and actually I came up with this formula as I was pulling, the, pulling these slides together. So the best way to learn is to teach, which is why I love doing this class with Arvind because it forces me to learn. So the way to calculate, I think the way to calculate the cannibal return formula is to look at the growth in earnings and multiply it with the, so you take 100 as a numerator and then 18 as the denominator in this case, which is the percentage of shares left. So it's about 5.5, which is the multiple pop you get because of share reduction and then the multiple expansion. And again, like I said, because right now no one is buying any homes with 7% mortgage rates and all of that, their multiple is pretty low. And this predicts a like a 783X and it's pretty close to that. It's 700 odd X in both cases. The second one, which is the poster child is AutoZone. And again, the interesting thing to remember about NVR and AutoZone is that these are very basic businesses. These are not businesses that you would think of as being high flyers or a high return equity or any of them, even though they've become that way. NVR is a very high return equity business because basically they took away anything that takes up 
a lot of equity. So if we look at if we look at AutoZone, they had over 150 million shares outstanding about 24 years ago, and and now they have billion shares outstanding because the shares outstanding have gone down a lot. It trades at the teens, mid to high teens multiple. And again, if we look at the story here, 87% of the shares have been bought back in 24 years, no dividends. They, did, they didn't get the memo about not doing stock splits. And uh, so they've continued to do the stock splits. But if you adjust their stock, it's basically gone from 27 to 2160. It's an 80, ba 80 bagger. Over this 24 year period, earnings went up 11X. And it's a 20% annualized rate return. So again, if you look at our formula, uh, you get about an 85X and 84X, so it's pretty close. Then we get to the other one, which is AutoNation. Both AutoZone and AutoNation are ones that Eddie Lampert had a significant position and actually had influence on the board. And basically, I think that's one of the reasons they went down this path. Of, of buying back their shares. AutoNation is basically a car dealer with dealerships all over the country. They've got all kinds of brands that they have dealerships for. Again, 450 million odd shares outstanding. And now it's about 56 million. And actually in their case, it's a little bit distorted because their multiple is really low right now. They're trading at four times earnings. So maybe this might be a something interesting to look at. But anyways, it's 88% 80, of shares gone in the last 24 years, no dividends. And uh, the stock is a eight bagger. So the earnings have gone up just three times, just a three X in earnings over this 24 year period, so about a nine and a half percent rate of return. But one thing to just adjust is that if their PE is of three or four times the current PE, then you wouldn't have an eight bagger. You would really have a 20 odd bagger and those return analyzed returns would change. So I haven't looked at AutoZone in a lot of detail and I haven't looked at specifically why it's at such a low multiple because generally speaking, the auto manufacturing business is not a great business, but the, the dealerships are a tremendous business. And especially if in, in their case, so they've got a lot of Porsche and Mercedes and BMWs and so on type dealerships. Basically the back of the house, which is doing all the parts and service, that's a license to print money. It's very high, high return. And the front of the house does really well on the, the used cars and the financing. The place they, where they don't do well is the new cars because people can compare them shop and all of that, but they, they tend to make it on the, on the financing and other aspects. So Overall, car dealerships are a very good business. Then we look at H&R Block, and this one actually was a little surprising to me to look at. So 24 years, they had 400 odd million shares outstanding, which is now about 160 million trades 10 times and historically it's traded a little higher. And again, in their case, they bought back 63% of shares. They haven't been as rigorous on their buybacks and as consistent, and they've had dividends and all that. Stocks only gone up 3x. And earnings have only gone up 1.4. So I would have expected this business to actually have done better because it's actually a very stable franchise business where the tax code keeps getting more complicated. And most of us either need TurboTax or some preparer. And H&R Block is a low cost producer amongst tax preparers. But anyway, it's an 8% annualized return with reinvested dividends. Then we look at Jack in the Box. They used to have 72 million shares outstanding. And Jack in the Box basically has been, over the years, slimming down. They've been converting their company-owned sh owned stores into franchise stores and, and, and getting a little more capital light over the years. But again, this is one I would have expected would have done better than it's actually done. But anyway, the shares outstanding have gone from... 70 odd million to 20 million. So they've bought back 71% of their shares in 16 years. Earnings have been flat, which is surprising. And just a 6.3% annualized return over that period. And recently they bought, they bought Del Taco, which is interesting. Uh, so the, it's like Taco Bell. And so we'll see what they'll, what they'll do with that. Usually these businesses, if you can run it the way Burger King is running, which is 
mostly franchised or with other way Dairy Queen runs, then they're really good businesses. Then we have Apple, which has basically gotten buyback religion in the last 10 years. And, and if we look at Apple, they used to have 26 billion shares outstanding and it's about 16 billion now. And they just reported earnings and they actually had a good, anyway, about 40% of shares have been bought back in the last 10 years. And again, split adjusted, it's a six bagger in the last 10 years, the earnings have gone up two and a half X. So Apple's delivered about a 21 and a half percent annual rate of return with the reinvested dividends. And, and we know that Warren has the stock and I think Warren is very happy with them doing these buybacks and increasing his ownership every every quarter or Berkshire's ownership. Then we have IBM, which also Berkshire used to own. And IBM in the last 28 years, they had about 2.3 billion shares out. And now it's about 900 million. And you can see that they basically stopped their buybacks in 2018. And in fact, the share count has been going up after 2018. And so if you look at the entire period, it looks like a six bagger and earnings went up three X, but IBM is actually a business that you actually have to parse a little more carefully. If you look at the business from 2001 to 2022, which is 21 years, it's zero returns. Uh, and the reason it's zero returns is it's actually a business in decline. And Buffett bought the stock in 2011. And he sold the stock in 2017. And for him, it was actually loss. It was negative returns over that period. And so one of the things that's really important about cannibals, it might be in the next slide. We'll actually get to that in a, in a second. And when you look at Sears, we have a number of stocks here where Eddie Lampert has his fingerprints, AutoZone, AutoNation, and Sears. The buybacks have worked for AutoZone and Auto Nation, they have not worked for Sears. And the reason they didn't work for Sears, he was buying back shares from 2006 to 2011 and took out about a third of the shares over that period. And basically, eventually Sears declared bankruptcy. And, and so if you look at this, this particular one, the returns are zero. Basically, they end up being multiplied by zero as a zero. So when we do buybacks, one thing to keep in mind that's really important is that we need to have a business. It's okay for the business to be cyclical. For example, NVR is a cyclical business. The business ebbs and flows, but we cannot have a business that goes into secular decline. And the nature of capitalism is that almost everything is going to go into a secular decline after a few decades or less. And so one needs to really have a viewpoint on what the business looks like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And I remember, I remember recently I, I was talking to Charlie and he was musing about Apple and he said, they don't really have much in terms of book value. And he was saying, look, if we own a, like a car dealership and the business kind of goes sideways or goes down, we've got the real estate and we've got a few hard assets and we can salvage something from all of that. A business like Apple is trading on a multiple of future earnings. It's not trading on one time book value or something. And Apple is an interesting business because at least when I look at it, I don't see anything affecting their franchise for 10 years, but I can't make that statement for 20 years. So what does Apple look like in 2042? And I don't know, it could be a much stronger company than it is today, or it could be a much weaker company than it is today. And I think 10 years from now, I would say that the odds are pretty high that Apple is still cranking, best I can tell. So anyway, I also want to parse NVR a little bit more than we did in the first go around. And this slide has a little bit more granular data on the amount of shares that are added to compensate manage management versus the shares bought back. So 
if you look at the towards the bottom there's a there's a row which says shares added through incentive plan and you can see in 94 it was two percent two percent then 96 it's 11 percent and there's been a consistent amount of shares that's been added now they bought back so much that the net effect is still a reduction in share count and we looked at the net reduction in share count but the thing is that if you if you look at it it's consistently through this entire period approximately five percent of the business has been given away to the knights who manage the castle so the ceo and the senior team is in effect extracting approximately five percent of the equity value every year as their as their compensation for running the ship and of course we have to pay the knights to run the castle but how much we pay them does matter and so if we look at nvr over the entire period entire 28 year period they bought back approximately six percent a year but if we look at this period from 94 to 2005 during that period they bought back nine more than nine percent a year and if you look at the returns over that period, 94 to 2005, the NVR stock went up 128x over that 11 year period, which is 55% annualized. And if we look at the period after that, which is 2006 to 2012, they only bought back less than 2% a year. And then again, 2013 to 2022 was about 4%, and 17 to 22 is about 2%. This is much lower than the 6% overall or the 9% over the over that period. And so if we look at the annualized returns from 2006 onwards, it's a 6x, 12.5%, not too bad. And then in the last five years, it's about 3% annualized. Now that's not a long enough period. Their stock has also gone down about a third over that period, but we can also see that their buyback rate has gone down a lot. So when we look at that formula we had, which is the multiple, the growth in earnings with the amount of shares that are reduced and then, and the, then the any kind of multiple expansion you get, a 2% annualized share count reduction is unlikely to get you to the promised land. And we'll see a little bit more about this in a second. And now if we compare it to Apple, for example, in this case, the night or the knights who are running the castle are on average taking about 1% of the business every year. So the incentives, the shares added through the incentive plan is approximately 1%. Now, of course, the difference in those two companies is a massive amount of size difference. So Apple has 400 billion or something in revenue and 2 trillion or something in market cap. And if they take away 20 billion a year and give it to their worker bees and their their senior management and so on it's more palatable just because the size is so big so one percent is okay it doesn't affect things that much five percent is there and vr has delivered over the years now the other thing that's happened with apple over the years is their multiple has gone up and so they bought back an average of five percent a year and really from 2013 to 19 it was five and a half percent close to six percent a year. more recently because the multiple has gone up it's about three and a half percent. And so it's unlikely that Apple, unless they were to lever up, is going to be able to buy back more than two to four percent a year. So the buyback rate is an interesting one to look at just because it, it tells you something. So why did buybacks not work for IBM and CEO? So we cannot have businesses. Just it's just common sense. I own 10% of a business, I keep buying back the shares. Over time, I own 20% of the business. That's all fine if the value of the business has gone up over that period. Earnings have gone up, everything's gone up, and then I get the kicker of more shares owned or more bigger fraction of the business owned. But if the business is in decline, it's actually going to hurt you a lot because you never got the dividends, you never got to put it somewhere else. So what can be a really great boost can end up being a terrible outcome because the business went into decline. So it's really important that when we look at these cannabis, you have to look pretty deep into the future. 
So let's say if you look at a business like AutoZone, in the absence of electric cars, if we continued with internal combustion engine cars, AutoZone is a great business. Basically, their demographic that uses AutoZone really leverages AutoZone a lot after the cars are out of warranty or extended warranty, kind of cars that are more than seven, eight, 10 years, 12 years old type of type of cars. And they really are a because they've got so much expertise in the store and ability to quick, quickly stock, stock up or replenish the stores and so on. And uh, they've got such high margins on, on, on their stuff. It works. Now, trick cars are very small today, but they're going to become a larger and larger portion. So California has a mandate that after 2035, you cannot sell internal combustion, combustion engine new cars. So the used cars are still there. But if, if by 2035 or 2040, or 2045, all cars sold, then they would start feeling that, they'll already start feeling it even now because there's a small decline taking place every year, which is going to become a large decline. And of course their demographic and the cars they're servicing. So what I'm saying is that I, I don't, I couldn't make a statement. I don't think AutoZone is going to go into a decline in 10 years. And they may not even go into a decline in 20 years just because of the gap, the lag from the time these cars, but 30 years becomes questionable. Nation, because the franchise laws of the US and all of that being so tight, I think the business will be around. But again, the back of the house, what is being spent on service today with combustion engine cars versus what will get spent on service with battery powered cars is quite different. So not quite sure whether the back of the house is going to be as good a business as it is today. It may be because the cars are more complex or so only the dealer can deal with them and so on. But so what I'm saying is that when we look at these businesses, it requires us to really go deep into the future and look at them to really, because if they're going to do these furious buybacks, then you need to look at that. So some things about the framework, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper is that again, we've talked about stable or growing earnings. One needs to have a view from 2022 to 2042. Cyclicality is okay. And we are a cyclical, but they typically don't lose much during downturns because they don't really build spec homes. Every home they build is already sold. And they just have a few models that people walk through and so on. And the only thing they lose when their sales go down is that their overhead, what it costs to run the businesses, they may not be able to scrim but. But if you look at this period from 2007 to 2009, which was pretty much the most extreme stress test you can put any home builder through. NVR was profitable through that period. Their profits dropped a lot, but they didn't lose money because of these characteristics. And uh, so there's an interplay between the earnings growth, global expansion, and the amount of shares bought back. And if a business is growing its earnings 15% a year, which means the earnings are doubling every five years in rule of 72. And 84% uh, of the shares are taken out over a 20 year period, that's a hundred bagger. So you didn't need to have a really high rate of 15% is a healthy rate of growth. Apple's growing about 10% a year or something. If earnings grow 10% a year, 80% of the shares are taken out. Apple expands by 50%. It'll be a 50 bagger in 20 years. So you can get some spectacular returns, even with 10, 15% consistent growers. So in the end, what matters after 20 years is what percent of the shares are gone? What are the typical earnings and growth? Is the business still stable and growing? What multiple is the market awarding the business? And the important thing in all these cannibal oriented businesses is they shouldn't hold back from investing or reinvesting in their business if they've got great opportunities. So AutoZone is still opening new stores. It's just that they're taking some of the excess capital and, and using that for buybacks. The interesting thing to keep in mind about cannibals is we had two very fine investing minds make large mistakes with cannibals. We had Buffett with IBM and we had Eddie Lampert with Sears. Sears is a mistake, but Eddie has been a great investor beyond that. He did really well with AutoZone and a bunch of other things. And I think the Sears and Kmart buys were really good. It was just him trying to run those businesses for a long time 
which was where the mistake lay. He had just bought, he actually got his money back pretty quickly by getting rid of some assets and some stores. And then I think he needed to just package and sell the whole thing and move on, which is where the mistake lies. If you look at some businesses, which I think look like great cannibal candidates, so ADP, for example, I think it happened because your disruption comes from all over the place, but I can't see their business really going into decline in 20 years. It hasn't gone into decline in 60 years. Tool works just because it's like a mini Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, Microsoft, I think, looks very solid for a very long time. Alphabet, Amazon, Tencent, maybe not Tencent after what's happening in China, but at least Tencent two weeks ago or something, but it still might be okay. But anyway, so these are really good cannibal can candidates. They need to prioritize internal growth at high ROE over buybacks, only buyback when they don't have other stuff going on. If we end up with a gifted capital allocator, which is really hard to end up with, who knows when to throttle the buyback, when to increase and when to decrease, then you really get magical returns. That's really hard to get because most management teams aren't really good at understanding when to do them. But we had one manager besides Buffett, and that was Henry Singleton who ran. And Henry Singleton, so Charlie knew Henry, and Henry could play chess blindfolded with eight people at the same time and beat them all. And uh, he, he was just an amazing manager, amazing business person, great capital allocator. So he formed, he founded Teledyne in 1960 and when he was 40 odd years old. And from 65 to 70, he acquired 130 companies, issuing stock to acquire these companies. And typically he was buying these companies for like, like around 10 times earnings. And he was issuing Teledyne stock to the sellers and the Teledyne stock was trading between 40 and 70 times earnings. So basically it was, you could think of it as a roll up, but it wasn't really. So he was very heavily in aerospace. Then he branched out into a few other places, but he, he did a bunch of things, which is very similar to the way Constellation software runs, or maybe even some similarity to the, similarities to the way Berkshire runs. So when he bought a company, even if he owned very similar related businesses, he left those companies alone and he left inefficiency in terms of they didn't try to consolidate the back office, put all the HR on the one company, put all the payroll and accounting under headquarters or any of that. He kept the business unit independent with the inefficiencies of running everything as a separate business. And the reason he did that, the same reason that Constellation does it, is he wanted to hold the managers accountable. So the managers had incentives. Typically they were the owners that had sold them the business or maybe someone the owner had nominated to run the business. And so they played very close attention to how these businesses were performing. And because they never integrated them with their acquisitions, they could easily do apples to apples comparisons and that and take care of that. Then in 70 and 72, when the bear market set in and Teledyne stock nosedived, its PE fell below 10 and he could no longer use stock to buy things. And what he did is from 72 to 84, in 12 years, Henry bought back more than 90% of Teledyne's shares outstanding. And his earnings in this 12 year period tripled. So he was at approximately $1.64 a share in earnings. And by 1985, he was $45 a share in earnings. The stock went up 40X over this period. And in fact, what Teledyne did is most of the buybacks were not done in the open market. He issued tender offers to buyback shares. And the first tender offer he issued in 74, he offered to buy a million shares, I think for $20 a share and 9 million shares got offered. So he was really shocked at the number that was offered and he took the entire 9 million. And then later he did six or seven of these tender offers and he didn't have the cash because the amount he was buying back outstripped the earnings. So what he did is he did exchanges. And so he told the 
shareholders that they could give Teladyne the stock they had. And in exchange, they got 10% debentures. And amazingly, all these people were really excited about taking the 10% debentures and giving him the stock. Nobody in the 70s wanted to own stocks. It was a terrible period in terms of return, but it was a great period for Henry. So you look at Henry in the 60s, he's issuing shares furiously, and the 70s is buying back shares like crazy. If we do a comparison between Tim Cook and Henry Singleton, I know this is not a fair comparison because Tim didn't have the 1970s to work with, but Apple tripled its earnings in the last 10 years and Teledyne tripled its earnings in 12 years. It took a little longer than Apple. So we have one for Tim and zero for Henry in terms of the earnings growth. Apple bought back 39% of shares in 10 years and Teledyne bought back 90% of shares in 12 years. Henry trounces Tim Cook and Apple's up 6x in 10 years and Teledyne's up 40x. And so here you see earnings going up very similarly or the buyback period is also very similar in terms of 10 or 12 years. But you see a huge difference because the valuation deltas allowed Henry to buy back. And Henry was furious about the buybacks in the sense that he bought back well beyond the earnings of Teledyne. He took on debt to buy back the shares. And then later he retired all the debt. And so you see this 40X in 1985 and Henry knew Charlie and he approached Charlie and Warren. I don't know exactly when, but my guess is somewhere in the mid eighties, he approached them. And he wanted to, after this 40X, sell the entire thing to Berkshire. And Berkshire was interested in buying Teledyne with a bunch of very high quality businesses. They, he even had bought a bunch of insurance companies and whatever. But what Henry wanted, I told you he pays chess blindfolded with eight people and wins in all eight. He told Warren and Charlie that he wanted only Berkshire stock. He didn't want cash. So his final, I would say, brushes on the painting was to take the 40X. Then at that time, Berkshire shares were about $2,000 or $2,500 a share. And so it would have been about a 200X from then till now to his estate. And of course, Warren and Charlie balked at issuing Berkshire stock. And, and so that deal never took place. And, uh, but Henry still did fine. And the interesting thing about Henry Singleton is the people he had on his board, he had guys, Sarofim in Dallas, the Egyptian Finks. You can look him up on Google if you've not heard of him. He passed away recently. He had Arthur Rock, who was one of the first venture capitalists ever in Silicon Valley, funded Intel and whatever else. And he had Claude Shannon. And uh, Claude Shannon was a MIT professor and he was a mentor to Ed Thorpe. So he really had, these are just amazing individuals. So Henry himself was amazing, but he had some really good advi advisors around him. So just an interesting person to study. And there's a book that came out several years ago called Distant Force, which was written by Henry's number two guy, I think George Roberts. It's a great book to read if you're looking to learn more about Henry. And so again, furious pace of buybacks was key. Henry took on lots of debt that he paid back later and Henry bought back well above the end. He really recognized when he had an opportunity and he went for it. So the key factors, how fast are the shares being retired? How quickly can we get to 80% gone? 80% shares gone means if the earnings are stable, you have a 5X. If there's no earnings growth and no multiple expansion. So you just get a 5X just based on shares being taken. And then you have to ask yourself, how much can earnings grow in this period? Earnings growth is key to multiplying that 5X. And then like Henry, can we buy back a lot of shares at low multiples and end up with high multiples and much higher earnings? And then we get to the promised land. And uh, so when you look at people like Henry Singleton and Warren Buffett, Buffett actually did not want to ever buy back shares. So he had a little different ethos from Henry. He did not, in his words, want to pay gin and rummy with his shareholders. So while Henry saw, thought of his shareholders as faceless people, Buffett thinks of his shareholders as partners. And so he doesn't want to really make money off his partners. He wants to make money with his partners. And that's why for the longest time, 
Berkshire resisted buying back shares. And I think only more recently, he's given a lot of, I would say, disclosures and, and is willing to buy back, but he wants to make sure the other side has all the information or nearly all the information that he does. So anyway, a little bit different ethos between Henry Singleton and Warren Buffett. Rare to have CEOs who know when to do buybacks. So this is a very rare skill. When to pause and when to issue shares. If you actually end up with a CEO who's a great operator, great capital allocator, and exceptional at knowing when to do the buybacks and when to issue shares, you're, you're like living in a utopian world. It's great. It's not great to be buying back shares at huge multiples. That just doesn't work very well. There is magic in buybacks and the magic really starts happening when you start taking out more than 80% of shares. So you buy back half the shares, you get a 2x if there's no change in anything else. You buy back two thirds, you get a 3x. You buy back 80%, you get a 5x. 90% is 10x and just keeps going. 99% is 100x. So the interesting thing is it really starts getting interesting after 80%. But what you also saw is to buy back 80% for most businesses can take two or three decades. And so you need a lot of stability in the business over a very long period of time. And you need to have a view that the business is going to be stable over that period of time. And then I didn't want to leave you hanging without any value addition with all this mumbo jumbo. So I got you a list that you can look at. And you can go shopping based on this list. These are all the companies that have the highest 10-year buybacks ordered by how much they bought back in the last 10 years. And we've got 167 companies that have bought back more than 30% of shares in the last 10 years. And you have all kinds of companies over here you can look at that have done that. Then we also have another list of companies that have done a lot of buybacks in the last five years. And again, it's another list you can look at and see which ones of these. What I would do if I were looking at this list is I would look at the ones that I have some way of knowing that the business is going to be stable 20 years from now. And probably the business is going to be bigger 20 years from now. So Union Pacific is in there. And uh, there's a good chance that railroad is cranking 20 years from now as well. H&R Block is probably going to be cranking 20 years from now. And uh, and so on. So another list you can uh, you can take a look at and uh, that's pretty much it we'll basically go to going over what you have on your mind